Mm-hmm. For those people who, who couldn't join tonight. Uh, okay. Hello, hello, uh, good evening. Uh, as I said, for Europe and good morning for 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 uh, Philippines. Um, uh, I'm really, really uh, uh, grateful that uh, I could host you tonight for uh, for this tasting of Luisita room, um, uh, the, the new room for Europe. Uh, I hope Paco will, will tell us uh, what about uh, Filipino market uh, and and your your run on done on that market uh, and. Um, uh, a few words about a uh, uh, few few words about me. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Piasecny. I came from Poland. Uh, I am a room category promoter, independent room category promoter, uh, also known as Ram Explorer. And uh, Precious Liquors company asked me to do this tasting for uh, for. Uh, um, they are new rooms. I mean, uh, they are um, official um, importer for uh, European market. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think uh, this session I won't run like um, some words from um, uh, representative of Persis Liquors uh, tonight, Martha. Uh, after that, after that, I ask Paco about uh, say something about him and about history about about uh, production process uh, and after that if you of course want to ask for anything Paco or Martha uh, free uh, feel free about this okay so let's start Martha Okay, um, good evening and good morning, Paco. Uh, first of all, I will be very quick, I promise. Uh, on behalf of Precious Liquors team, uh, welcome to our masterclass. First of all, thank you for your huge interest. It, it was really amazing uh, and for being here tonight with us. It's really late, so we are really uh, happy that you are here and you are here for a treat. Uh, so as the official representative of Luisita brand in Europe, uh, we will present you a range of their fantastic rums. And uh, they are coming to the old continent very soon. So uh, we are looking for uh, distributors and resales uh, in Europe. Uh, what is also very important that if you need any other information, pricing list uh, to get an offer, or you have any uh, kind of a question regarding the uh, um, sales, uh, you have received with the samples this business card. So you can contact Piot directly on his email. And uh, that's it, I think, for me. Without any further ado, I think it's most important to focus on the liquids. And you have four of them tonight. And I encourage you also to comment, ask questions, give us any kind of feedback. It's highly appreciated. If you're too shy yeah. to talk, you can type it on the chat. And I think that's all. I think that's it for me. Uh, Chris and Paco, the stage is yours. And how you say in Philippines, Tagai? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you got it. <laughs> thank you, Marta. Thank you, thank you, uh, Paco. Uh, some questions from from me uh, for, for for the beginning, uh, and uh, and of course the stage is uh, the stage is yours. Uh, first of all, uh, about you, uh, uh, what is your uh, simple day looks like? How you work? Uh, where you come from? You know about you personally. Okay, uh, so yeah, good evening. It's nice to know it's good evening for everyone. Uh, although we are not against day drinking. <laughs> uh, so yeah, actually, you know, a normal day for me. Um, Paco, uh, farm farmer behind the brand that is Duisita Rum. So a normal day looks like this. Maybe I wake up 30 minutes uh, later than today, but uh, all is well. Uh, starts around five, uh, hit the farm, 
Um, being in the tropics, it gets it gets very hot mid afternoon. So we like to start at the farm at around six six thirty. Get the tractors out. Get any work out of the way. Um, and then we head over. I head over. My, I myself after the farm. I head over to the mill and the distillery, and then go about different processes. Uh, and then it's base done at around four, five, six. You know, you're pretty much spent with energy. I maybe will get a round of golf in. Uh, during the pandemic, I enjoyed a lot of bird watching, so I do that from time to time as well. Um, and then it's just uh, an early evening, definitely rum involved. It's the first choice of drink, sometimes sake, sometimes wine. Uh, and then it's just a rinse and repeat cycle. Uh, so I actually live in the more rural part of the Philippines. So any of you have, who have been to the Philippines... We're about two hours north of Metro Manila. Um, they call it the plains of Central Luzon. So we're in a very landlocked region of the country uh, that primarily grows sugarcane, some rice, and some corn as well. Okay, okay. Thanks very much. Uh, what about what about um, your company, your distillery? Uh, how uh, what was the history you know from the ah, okay. sugar cane actually, and... actually um to help with that if if I, I don't know if you have screen sharing on here i i can uh, show a brief sort of presentation okay. i i have to do you a host uh ah, okay that you can then, get to this okay do you want and it then... Yeah, yeah. Then I can. Uh, I prepared something pretty short for okay. for you guys. Remember, so, we remember to give it back later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <On your end. laughs> uh, okay. Give me one second here. Yeah, us farmers are not the best when it comes to uh, technology. <laughs> okay, uh, there's someone in the waiting room. Should I let him in or? If, if there are someone, let him in. Okay, okay. There we go. So yeah, so as I mentioned a while ago, um, the farmer behind the brand, that's Luisita Ram. So I literally do the farming. Uh, so we are really farmers at heart. So my first love, I always tell this to people, uh, we launched in 2020 and we always ask, um, these, these questions. And I like to say my first love is really sugarcane. Um, I love all things to do with sugarcane. Uh, I'm fourth generation now or fifth generation sugarcane farmer in my in our in our area and in our family so i i really see myself as a steward of this land this estate this Luisita estate that's sort of fallen onto my laps at the moment and uh at the very core of the brand is uplifting that spirit of sugarcane the hard work that goes out behind it is very archaic and old plant um it's really we all know it produces sugar, and now we've we've ventured into capturing its spirit, which is the rum. Um, and because all the sugar cane comes from an estate, a single estate, we we really intentionally want to bring out the flavor and the essence, or if you will, uh, I hope any French in the audience, I will borrow um, a very popular French term, terroir. Uh, that we hope to capture in, in the rum. So three simple things that we, we like to stress is the heritage of the estate being established in 1881. <laughs> and of course, the authenticity of it all being a single estate since, since that period. And then community. So for us, it's really eight, our number one resource as 
cliche as it sounds, is definitely HR, so the human resource for all these machines, all the columns, all the mill, the mill and everything. Without the people behind it, that would just be that. Uh, so just a quick, a sweet beginning for Luisita. Um, picture, there's are some pictures taken from the earlier eras, maybe the early 1900s. So in 1881, the first Marques de Comedias of Spain actually found this expanse of land. Uh, it was actually three times the size at that, at that time. And he named it after his wife, wife Luisa. Um, so he ran this company called Tabacalera. They were in, they were involved in tobacco and sugarcane commerce here in the Philippines when we were still a part of Spain. Uh, through the years, uh, Luisita had become sort of a pillar for sugar in the region, um, withstanding much of uh, history's events, uh, be it the Japanese. Uh, when we were under Japan, um, Americans, and so on. So a little, so some tidbit uh, after World War II. So this one, this part I found fascinating is you will see here General Douglas MacArthur actually came back. Uh, he spent at least a good two months at Luisita. So we still have the historical marker of the house that he used as his headquarters. Uh, when you do uh, get the chance to visit us, you will be able to see the house. Uh, it's slowly falling apart because of a weird law that's saying that we cannot touch it. But uh, hopefully this year they allow us to strengthen some of the beams of this very old house. Uh, so a bit, a bit of how the family sort of got into to rum making. So we brought in, in Luisita, we brought in our first barrels uh, in 2016 and really went commercial in 2020. But upon further research, uh, my great grandfather actually began, I guess, rum trading inadvertently. So after the war around the 1950s, there was a famous uh, fort that was called Fort Stotzenberg. This is very nearby. Luisita. Um, it's now known as uh, Clark Air Base, which the Americans had used as an air base up until the 90s, and I think that's going to continue soon. But beside, beyond that point, what happened was, um, so the war had just finished and there was a scarcity of gas. And my great-grandfather rolls into Fort Stotzenberg on his, with his jeep, and the Americans ask him how you're running it. And he proceeds to tell them that he's using ethanol. Um, and they were just blown away. And he was wondering why they, why they were blown away. I guess having been in war for, for quite a number of years, they wanted something to calm their minds and uplift their spirits. So they had no idea that there was this ethanol plant at the time, ethanol plant sitting, you know, quite near them. So they said, stop filling your cars with ethanol. We will give you all the gas you need. And you give us all the ethanol for us to drink. So that, that's really how he started as a rum runner. So that's a little tidbit that we found out. And the mill and distillery, uh, actually supplied local rum spirits called rum caña and añejo. Uh, some of them, añejo, if I'm not mistaken, um, became tanduay eventually. I, I think some of you are familiar with tanduay. Not, not the, uh, uh, not my first choice, but uh, at the time it was supplying um, tanduay. So more into the single estate. So it really all begins with the soil. So we're a plain surrounded by, uh, in, in local folklore, they call them, there's two deities that surround us, but in reality or geo geo geographically, we're surrounded by two volcanoes. So Mount Arayat on the Eastern portion and Mount Pinatubo, which actually recently exploded um, not too long ago, well, long enough ago, nine, around 1991, if I'm not mistaken. 
So it's a very rich or um, volcanic soil that we have in the area. And we believe that this, uh, you know, really having good soil allows good plants to grow, in this case, good sugarcane. And good sugarcane will give us that great molasses, which we can then ferment into even better rum. So just some pictures, uh, sugarcane, for those of you who are unfamiliar of the growing process of sugarcane, it's actually grown, it's propagated from the stalk. So as pictured on the left, um, the picture in the center is about 30 days after that, that stalk um, is, has been in contact with the ground and some moisture. And then it takes about 12 to 14 months for it to mature, that would be more on the right side. So just, um, I'd like to show this as just an example of how we really get into the breeds or the varieties of sugarcane at Luisita. Um, really looking at the growing characteristics, the type of soil that we can match them to, and then more importantly is their maturation and their sucrose content, because the sucrose is what gives us those fermentable sugars eventually. So harvest season comes. Actually, we just ended harvest season uh, four days ago, and I'm about to enter a two-week hibernation uh, after four months of nonstop uh, harvesting, distillation, planting, and all that. So it all it's all compressed into a five-month, six-month period. So we just ended that a few days ago. Uh, previously, that was manual harvesting, and here you have a picture from um, our mechanical harvesters with Mount Ariat in the background. So these are all sort of old trucks left behind by the Japanese and the Americans that we repurposed. So obviously they were troop carriers once upon a time and they still carry the precious cargo to the mill, not troops. So at Luisita, it's really uh, from the farm to the mill, so hence the single estate. I'm just sort of bringing everyone through that. Um, we use molasses, a proprietary blend of three types of molasses that we have access to from our production of sugar. Uh, and this is what we use in fermentation. So this picture here is a, a sugar mountain. So just I like showing this because it, it's really important to the taste of Luisita. When we were coming up with it, um, one of our consultants who used to work with the West Indies uh, distillery, he asked us um, during fermentation or, or what would, what do you feel, uh, what flavor of, of, of would you like um, Luisita to have a sort of the core in terms of fermentation and the distillate. And my cousin, my dad and I, uh, we said it would, it would have to be brown sugar because we all grew up sliding down this, uh, we call it sugar mountain. So there's no snow in the Philippines, but somehow we're very, you know, we grew up watching all of these cartoons with snow. So once upon a time, and still sometimes, we grab some cardboard boxes and slide down this thing and pretend it's like negative five degrees centigrade or something like that. Uh, but of course, with the heat and the humidity, you come out, you know, all sticky and sweet. So it's not the worst thing. So at the later, as we go through the tasting, um, it, it's good to know that, or to, to keep in mind that we'd like to have that sort of brown sugar. Uh, it's very intentional in our distillate and in our rum. So some pictures of the mill, of course, many of this machinery dates back to um, 18, late 1800s, early 1920s. So of course, fermentation, um, not, uh, not something you guys are unfamiliar with. I think all of us who enjoy our spirits are best friends, the yeast. We all know their role that they play. So at Luisita, we have a localized yeast. Um, originally, it was nothing special. Uh, it was a commercial strain of yeast purchased from our local agricultural university in the 1970s. And then later on, uh, we every time we have a good batch, we just, it, it, it's sort of like an animal. It's, it's, it's like a fungi. So 
as it goes on, its genetics acclimatize to the region and it, it really uh, becomes uh, becomes or to, it, it localizes itself. So we play this up um, during fermentation. And then, of course, in distillation, this is where we we extract now the alcohols that were made in fermentation. So, uh, I like to stress this all the time when I talk about making rum. Um, and I guess it's true for most all spirits is that the flavor, apart from really being made in the field in the plant, uh, when it comes to fermentation and distillation, fermentation is where the is where the alcohol is made, is where the flavors are made, and in distillation, it's just capturing it both equally important of course uh, if you're not good at, at, at catching things maybe at like fishing you won't get the right flavors um, but these two go hand in hand but fermentation should not be forgotten um, we put more fo focus in fermentation at Luisita so of course there's my our favorite uh, molasses uh, in this part of the world I use that as my maple syrup I'll be doing so when I have my pancakes after this and on the right, you'll see uh, we actually have a twin column set up uh, with a purifier purifier in the middle. The column was put up by a company called Squire sometime in the late uh, 1920s. So some of the esters, for those of you who are familiar with this or want to dive a little more into the rum rabbit hole. So these are some of the esters that we detect and intentionally uh, um, sort of allow for the yeast to develop in fermentation. So some esters like isoamyl, isobutanol, propanol is one that's very common to, to rum. Um, ethyl acetate is one that's common to, and diacetyl would also be common to fermentation in tropical countries. So after the mill, after the distillery, we move to the bodega where we brought in our first set of barrels early part of 2016. These were actually um, consisted primarily of ex-bourbon barrels from Makers, uh, not Makers Mark, from Heaven Hill and Wild Turkey. Uh, and then we also brought in some, some of the sherry cask, the sherry which you will be trying, uh, um, Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso. So, you rum aficionados definitely know that aging in the tropics is a lot quicker. Uh, the interaction with the barrels a lot faster as compared to, let's say, if we were aging in Scotland, where we'd have to wait really the 12 years, the 15 years. So some say three times as quick in the tropics, four times as quick. But of course, life is fair. Um, and the trade-off is that our angel's share is much higher. And recently they found that the farmer's share is even bigger. So I'm in a bit of hot water for that. <laughs> uh, so this is a picture of the bodega. Some of you may or may not notice one of my other favorite Polish friends. <laughs> I don't have many, but they're all my favorite. Um, uh, he visited us, a good friend, Jarek visited us a few months back last year and uh, we have decent accommodations, but he decided to get the VVIP treatment. He said the barrels were better than any Tempur-Pedic bed you could find. So the rum range, uh, in front of you, you will be trying the single barrels. Um, basically, rums that would be a shame to blend. They stand really well on their own. So we taste the barrel, we score them. Um, this was born out of the pandemic where my team and I got stuck in the farm. It wasn't a bad thing. Um, there was a liquor ban in the country. We were surrounded by all this rum. So we said, okay, hey, let's uh, get everyone on social media jealous and let's start doing some rum tasting. So we started scoring the barrels. And from there, we, we, we noticed differences in barrels, whether barrel type, by location, year, and, and et cetera. And this is where the single barrel series was born. And um, Precious Liquors actually hand-selected the barrel um, to one eight three. And then the blended series, this is where we get a little more, uh, shall you say, creative and 
uh, like a painter, we, we start mixing all of these barrels together to see if we can come up with even more unique flavors. It's all about this journey of discovery and really, uh, I guess it stems from being a farmer, just being curious about everything that you see in nature. So this is sort of the same thing. Uh, so in 2020, we launched with at least three single barrels, 8157 being our first, and then the other two on the side coming soon after that. We did also release a Oloroso sherry cask prior to this Pedro Jimenez. Um, this one turned out also very good. So our 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 sherry releases are different in the sense that everyone was saying that we should finish in a sherry cask, but we decided, okay, if everyone's doing that, let's do the opposite. Let's just finish completely or start and finish in a sherry cask. So it, it didn't touch any other type of cask or wood. Um, one of our previous bottles garnered 92 points at the International Wine and Spirits Competition um, as well. So something we did not, uh, we actually just joined to see the logistics behind bringing a bottle. And um, I had, to be honest, I forgot about this. And then one day, one morning at uh, the gym, I get a call and, you know, some guy was telling me I'm from the IWSC, he scored 92 points. And that was a very proud moment for us. Um, so yeah, this evening, you guys will be trying our distillate. I don't think it's at 60%. Uh, this is just an old, actually, this is a placemat that we use for our master classes. Um, so you'll be trying the distillate. Uh, you'll be trying the small batch. Uh, then barrel 2183, and then I would recommend we end with the sherry because it's at that higher ABV. So normally, I, 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 locally, I, I, I have to educate people on how to enjoy rum because they're very much used to the Tendwais of this world and Bacardi's of this world, I guess, where uh, it's just rum and coke. Um, so now it's introducing them into this world of sipping. So I, I guess I'll just go through it really quickly. So of course, through site. So talking more about the brand, there's no caramel added there. We don't do any chill filtration. What you see is what you get. Um, on the smell where it's really, I personally say it's subjective, but it's very important. It's your smell and your taste go together. Um, the last part in this slide is what's most important to me it should allow you to invoke memories. You know, that's really, I think we all agree that is the beauty of spirits. Uh, it takes you back to good memories, bad memories. If you have to pull out that tissue, why not? I've, it's happened to me quite a few times. Um, then of course, through taste, uh, it, it'll have that inherent, so I put here sweet, but um, I don't want to say sugar sweet. So there's a difference between molasses and sugar cane sweet and sugar sweet. And to me, this is uh, inherent in the rum. It has that natural sweetness. We don't add any sugar, no caramel, uh, no sweeteners in our rum. And whatever you taste, no one can discredit that. So if you're tasting something like beef brisket, then please, by all means, share it with us. I've never, I have not yet to taste that in the rum, but if you taste it, then it's probably there. Uh, and then, of course, most important is the emotion. So just like provoking any memories. Uh, it's all about having those emotions and sharing a fun time with your friends, like all spirits, but hopefully it's rum. Okay, uh, I guess if everyone um, has already been tasting the samples or has not, and you'd like to taste it together, uh, I can explain more about it. And then maybe, you, um, first off, you can you can ask me any questions or anyone, I guess, can ask me questions as I go through okay. these. Yeah. Uh, I I wish, but but unfortunately, you just answered uh, for many of my questions. Oh, great, great! I'm sorry, if, I'm sorry if I yeah yeah. We can have the Q and A after. I just wanted to you know I I, I wanted to come in prepared so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, you know, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, um. Guys, uh, try this rum, uh, please. If if someone didn't do that yet, 
uh, please do this uh, in your own uh, way, in your own, um, uh, 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 you know, specific, um, uh, um, I, I forgot the word, um, uh, your, your, your own specific way, yeah. Uh, and uh, I have one question for you, Paco. Uh, what do yes. you what do you think your RAM will be positioned in RAM category? Where, uh, uh, what, in your opinion, is your uh, for Luisita uh, the nearest competition? You know, hmm. nearest competition. Uh, I would say nearest competition on the shelf. Uh, Of course, there's the aspiration to be very much like a, I guess, um, especially from the no sugar, no no caramel, I guess you guys can surmise that I, I am an enjoyer of four square rums. Um, I also do like, uh, so four squares one, privateer, I also, I also like that one from the state. So, so many of, many of these, uh, um and then many of like let's say mount gay i like mount gay as well and and appleton so, so more of the honest brands um on the market uh i see someone here is raising yeah yeah Tafukas, i think he has a question uh, yes, yes, I have a question uh, because um, yeah. I, I would like to, to uh, you know, to to, to understand uh, uh, the the production process. So you have your own uh, uh, your own um, sugar cane, uh, your own uh, uh, plantation, and your family is from uh, 19th century working in uh, with with the sugar cane. Uh, but uh, for for uh, uh, a melassa and for the the, the um, distillation, the, uh, uh, this is the central azucarera de Tarlac. Yes, this is the place where. Uh, okay, the, the, you are collecting the, the sugar cane. You are harvesting the sugar cane. Then you um, you, you 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 drive to to this uh, central azucarera. Uh, they are making. Uh, they have their own meal. They are making. A melassa, and they are distilled, or you have your own uh, the, uh, the the distiller and your own column uh, on on on, on uh, the Luisita uh, Hacienda Luisita side. Okay, um, so yeah, great question. Um, so actually, Luisita is the mill of, I mean, Central Azucarera de Tarlac is the mill of Luisita. So we're the only mill in town. Um, and I also, I also have a stake in the mill. So, uh, we have a, we have our own, um, column there. So actually my dad runs mill operations. So it's technically like I'm sending my sugar, uh, to my dad. And then we both ferment it together, ferment and distill together in the mill. So we have complete control over everything. Um, and it's all done in the estate. Uh, except, of course, for the barrels, which sadly, the technology does simply doesn't exist in the Philippines at the moment. We can't produce our own barrels. So that's the only thing that actually doesn't come from the estate. And of course, the glasses. I am, uh, I'm not, uh, I am not a uh, glass maker. But uh, yes, the Central La Zucarera de Tarlac um, uh, is the mill inside in the middle of the Luisita estate? Okay, thank, thank, thank you. Now I now I understand. Okay, this is the the part of of of, of the company of of uh, Luisita. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, uh, and uh, this is a uh, uh, the, the uh, double distillation. Yes, you have uh, two uh, columns uh, for for, for yeah. the distillation, but the, those are. Typical agriculture columns. That those are not the uh, uh, columns like for Bacardi, uh, Rom, like the multi-column system. Uh, you have only two columns, yes? Yes. Uh, actually, we have we we do have those other other columns still. So um, what 
Actually, it's a very good question. So when we started in 2016, the column that, that was pictured here, the, the twin column, so uh, our twin column is actually the, or the double distillation. It's a beer. We have a beer still where we feed mm -hmm. directly from fermentation. Um, and then we, ha well, we have what we call an aldehyde column in the middle or a purifier. Um, and then, so this sort of cleans up the methanol. And then we have a rectifier right after mm -hmm. that. So the rectifier is where uh, I think I failed to touch on it on a previous slide, but you'll see there's many, many, many tapping points in it. I went crazy. Our rectifier has about um, 70, man, it's too early in the morning, 73, 74 plates. And mm -hmm. I, but we did, we put a tapping point on each. So unlike a pot still where it's about making cuts with, with column distillation, we found, um, and it's not, it's not a, it's not a new concept, but I picked it up from the St. Lucia distillers, uh, the guys behind chairman's reserve where uh, you can actually make a heavier style of column rum um, by finding the location on the column where this uh, flavor is found. So it's all about location in a column still. Um, to your question on the multi-column stills, we actually have those as well, um, fully stainless steel. And those are actually... <clears throat> the ones that have been running since maybe the 1950s, the, the fairly modern columns. Uh, we don't use that for rum production. Um, that just helps pay the bills. Uh, so what happened was when our, when this guy from Barbados came in in 2016, we were showing him a lot of the multi-rum columns and he's like, oh, this is, this is, it's neutral. Um, and it's not something we had heard before because our local Tanduay, uh, canceled the contract with us and another brand in Ebra canceled their contract with us because we were not producing neutral enough spirit for them. For I don't know why they would want neutral spirit, but we weren't producing enough neutral spirit for them. Uh, is this is for, for the bio bioethanol? Bioethanol at, 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 for the, oh, the other stills, yeah. Uh, the okay. column that we, that we use actually was meant to be uh, scrapped because it was put up in the 1920s. It was all copper. So our guys and us at the time, we, we didn't realize its value until our, our, our mentor um, told us that that's the column that you should be using because you know it's all copper. It was probably designed for flavor. So when we fired her up, man, were we happy not to, uh, to chop her up into into scrap because without her, we would just be using a multi-column system and maybe be very similar to a Bacardi style operation. Mm -hmm. And after first distillation, it's about uh, 80 uh, ABV and about second, it's about 95. When you are receiving the spirit, yes? There about, so about 80 in the first from the beer, and then uh, we get it off the rectifier at about 93 to 94.5, sometimes 95, but that, that, that would be, that wouldn't be too ideal. Um, not much flavor coming out at 95. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Most welcome. Okay, guys, any, any, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so what type of yeast you use? Okay, oh. uh, yeah, well, you know, we're really still trying to, officially, the yeast was bought from U, uh, University of the Philippines, uh, um, Los Baños, which is an agricultural, it's our top agri-university in the country. And, you know, I actually, I asked the guys to look for the receipt so we would know exactly, because this was way before I was born. This was sometime in the 80s. Uh, we believe that it was probably just like maybe some Y2 or maybe something not far from Brewer's East, most likely. Uh, Definitely not some special rum yeast because most of the yeast that 
not most, all these that, that this university looks at is for efficiency in ethanol, uh, which is what all the distilleries in the Philippines are geared toward. They don't really know that they can produce rum. Um, luckily, what happened was over the years, um, the distillery men, we call them here distillery men and women uh, at this point because they're all women now, uh, they every time there was a good batch in terms of flavor, so they would they they taste at that time. Um, they get some of that yeast and then put it back into the mother strain. So we haven't bought yeast since, but I think the safe answer is to say that it's it's probably brewer's yeast, but it it's it's localized and adapted to Luisita over the past what almost fifty years now. Okay. Um, and fermentation, how long is the process? So fermentation is about 24 to 26 hours, very quick. Uh, and we do this looking at factors like chai, so that's total sugars as invert, and then the bricks, of course. So once the fermentation has run its course, uh, it's normally the, norm, the sweet spot's about 25 to 26. You go a little longer. Um, I wouldn't say it gets funkier. It gets just as funky as a column still rum without a muck pit could get. Uh, but thereabouts, about 26 hour fermentation time. Okay, cool. And you said bricks. Okay, so how many bricks do you have in your sugar cane? Mm, so bricks and sugar cane. So this year, our average bricks was at about 21, uh, which is actually higher than, than previous years and considering we got a lot of rain. And then I guess maybe a follow-up question would be the bricks and the molasses were at about uh, 88. So our mill, uh, we've been told to keep the mill inefficient to give us better molasses. So uh, whenever the mill guys start um, giving us bad news and like inefficiencies, you know, it's like relax, hold my rum. Um, this is not a bad problem. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, I have, a, I have a more general question, not regarding production, but uh, I think Philippines is a fairly new country for um, rum lovers. So maybe if you could, Paco, uh, elaborate a little bit on the current state of the market, because we also know it's a very big country, potentially a, hu a huge consumer market. We also have other Asian countries potentially interested in your rums. Uh, but we don't see many premium rums coming from the Philippines, not many premium distilleries such as yourself. So if you could uh, maybe just comment on this. Yeah, uh, you know, this is actually a, this, a topic that we love to discuss, you know, amongst the team and, and, and amongst industry guys and the state of Philippine spirits. Uh, I, I mean, I will admit that I guess a lot of, a lot of you might be, we don't have the highest image in the world, I guess. Um, largely in part to many of the brands that are associated with the Philippines or that have made it to the world stage. Uh, I guess the hot topic of the town, and let's address the elephant in the room, is the big sale of uh, Don Papa to Diageo. Um, so I think, at least locally, the market enjoys a sweeter product. Um, one that's easy to drink, uh, has a lot of mouthfeel. So th there's a lot of spiced products in the Philippines, be it spiced brandy or maybe um, spiced gin, um, if that's even a thing. But uh, it, it, we consume a lot of alcohol. Um, I, I, I think I read somewhere once that uh, Tanduay is the biggest, if not second to Bacardi, um, in terms of the volume that they push out. And it dawned on me that Tanduay, 99.9% .9 of their sales are local. So 
I, <laughs> that really paints a picture of, of what of what the alcohol consumption in this country um and also we they find 40 percent here so you guys are actually drinking like the, the pedro jimenez is at 62 percent and locally that one is really seen as like what the hell are you guys doing because uh 40 percent is already seen as high abd here in this market we're more used to seeing products uh between say 22 to 28 percent alcohol so there's a lot of what you call brandy light or rum lights in the market uh lighter versions of the spirit um i i, I don't blame them i think this became the culture because there are 110 million of us and growing and a bulk of our population is between 25 to say 45 years old so it's really the, the spending powers there they're working the, the drive the, the the desire to drink is there so it's a mass market product at least for the philippines um luckily though i have met a few people along the way um two people now uh, one of them is generally He's a good friend from from before also. Uh, he's down south on one of the bigger islands called Mindanao. And he's actually, I don't know if I should be preempting it, but um, I'll just, I won't say the name of the brand, but he, he's actually coming out with a agricole type of rum. So he's fermenting straight from uh, sugarcane juice using native varieties. So that's something to look out for. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be exporting, but uh, right now it's like a passion project of his. So we, maybe to just expound more why we went off the beaten, or sort of we went off the, yeah, with the beaten path, is because my father and I, uh, we started our journey in spirits really with wine. Um, and it was about... Um, I'm I, I'm I'm 31 now, and and for as long as I can remember, it's always been wine. My dad always opened a bottle of wine or had a glass of wine um, at dinner time. Uh, never breakfast. I've yet to see that. Um, but uh, so it started with wine, and it still is very much wine for him. So when we got into the rum project. Uh, we were always joking ourselves. He was joking everyone back maybe 10, some 10 years ago that if he wins the lotto or if sugar prices suddenly become uh, exorbitantly high, um, maybe the cannabis prices or something like that, then, then we'd sell it all off and uh, buy a vineyard in Burgundy or say Napa. Uh, then fast forward to 2016, um, this this consultant from Barbados who's now a mentor and friend actually kind of uh, made us see the whole operation in front of us in a different light where he was he kind of presented the sugarcane field as being our vineyards um, the distillery of course as being the means to capture the alcohol the mill as having the byproduct of molasses and potentially even sugarcane juice in the future and then all we really needed was a little bit of know-how and fermentation, bring back the important part is bringing back the copper, the copper column and some barrels. And then we could produce sort of the wine of the tropics, he called it at the time. And so this has been our approach. This is why uh, we are not going the route of many of the bigger I guess distilleries or spirits producers in the country were taking the more premium route, <clears throat> not only because it's what we know and what we love and what excites us, but also um, it's going to be able to add more value to the farmers. Uh, so being a farmer myself, I, I know the struggles of, of the other um, farm owners and the other people who have interests in the farm and you know, it's time for them to move beyond sugar and seeing what happens in Barbados and Jamaica that also uh, is a driving force, force to premiumize and, and, and maybe even change the perception of a Philippine rum. So I get asked a lot actually also is what makes us different from Don Papa and 
for those of you that have maybe don't uh, maybe have tried don papa you can see it's a very different style uh I, I i really have no idea how they make their rum um in the same way they have no idea how we make our rum but it's a it's a really different style from two different regions of the philippines and uh i i'm really happy with the way our rum has been aging it's really it, it really showcases what luisita stands for no. I, I hope I hope I answered your question. I, I realize uh, I may have blabbed totally. longer, That's but okay. totally. Thank you so much. Um, how many variations of sugarcane you have on your fields? Ah, okay. I love I love these questions. Um, <laughs> right now, Sorry. right now we no no these are great. Uh, I, I love it when it when the agri questions come into the talk because I think. You know, it's, it, there should be that connection, right? It, people should know that rum comes from sugarcane. Recently, had uh, just, just before I answer your question, I, I had someone ask me locally and at our event, and he was he was really wow. Thank you. I learned something today. I, I learned that rum comes from sugarcane. So that's very that's the state of affairs for the Philippine market at least. But in terms of sugarcane varieties, we have. Currently, we have 10, so we, we like to keep it that way in the farm. Um, and then we change every every five years, five to 10 years. So once it loses its hybrid vigor, uh, we change up to varieties. Uh, we're not yet at a point where we have varieties or research our research center, breeding centers, breeding varieties specific for better rum production. Uh, it's all geared towards high sucrose, which I guess is also, in a way, um, it's it's we're working with what we have. So high sucrose levels will also equate to more sugars, which allow us to ferment more. But um, we have expressed the idea uh, also with my friend down south for them to maybe explore more native varieties that have different tastes um, and maybe are not as sweet. Uh, so I actually drink a lot of sugarcane juice every day myself. Um, and you will find like even between these 10, you can characterize them as some being more really sweet, some having a woody taste, some being floral. So yeah, we have 10 varieties, which we cycle every 10 years. Thank you. Okay, guys. Any any questions? Any more questions? Or maybe uh, someone want to tell uh, on the on the uh, on the group what do you think about about the, uh, these rams? You tried them already? Yeah, I have a question. How how old is the small batch? Yeah. Ah, okay. I I can actually so the small batch. Uh, there we go. Um, so the small batch is the youngest rum in there. Okay, so when people ask me how old it is, I will always tell you what the youngest rum in the blend is, and it's a three-year-old um, in the small batch. The oldest one being, we don't know how old. Um, so if you'll see here, we call this blend de la casa, or it translates to house blend. So the house pictured here is the house where you saw Mark Arthur pictured in back in when he visited in the 1950s. Um, so this is Casa Grande, it's sort of the, one of the oldest, and it's in the center of the estate. So the small batch is really a blend of everything in our inventory, um, ex bourbon barrels of different ages and different marks or vintages inside. Some Olorosos in there, some Pedro Jimenez. Um, then we also have. What we have is the secret sauce. So we have, well, now I only have three. We had four um, really high ester uh, rum that's sort of been aging Solera style in these virgin French oak casks. And when we were researching uh, their, their origin, because we just stumbled upon them under this house. No, they were not from MacArthur. You know, I really thought that would have been the case. That would have made a great story. Uh, but it was from my grandfather and his brother. 
uh, they brought in these barrels sometime in the 80s and then I think it continued until the 90s where after every sugarcane harvest, they just get some of the, it wasn't good rum listed it, I think, but really high ester. Uh, there used to be a pot still close by in one of the hacendas. So a cognac pot still, but that was sold for, for scrap. So that distillate was put into these French oak barrels. Um, and it was meant to supply, they had a, a family rum brand. You know, they called it Paniki rum. Funnily enough, Paniki translates to bat. So the, it actually looked like Bacardi. I don't know if they were going for that. Um, but it was personal consumption. Anytime someone had a birthday, they'd serve this rum. Uh, I remember drinking it, but not making the connection that it came from these barrels. Because I don't know, between the two brothers, they'd age it for so long inside this cask. But then prior to drinking, they'd dilute it to 30% and run it through a carbon filter to kind of strip all of the color out. So... They, they 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 weren't too sure what they were doing at the time, but they were happy doing it. So that's what's in this blend. We have some pot still rum um, from a cognac still. Uh, one of them still exists. It belongs to a a good friend of mine. He has a distillery uh, in Manila, um, but it's on display. It's still it's just on display in his distillery. Uh, he makes. Philippine, Philippine calamansi liqueur spirits and stuff like that. Uh, so that's the secret sauce in this small batch blend. The youngest rum would be three years old. Uh, that's an ex bourbon. That would be the base. Um, and that's our Mark One distillate or our basic Mark. So once I'm all out, I only have three more of this high ester rum. Uh, I'll have to figure out a way of uh, getting back that funk in. Uh, luckily, we brought in a small little pot still. It's it's in customs now. Just waiting it for it to clear. So this will hopefully augment what we've been taking out of this of these barrels, and then give us sort of some pot still also for the future. You are telling us about uh, high ester rum, but have you measured it somehow? Do you know how many esters are in there? Uh, yeah. Um, give me a sec here. I can actually. So let me probably can't flash it, but I have the data here. We, we looked at it again the other day recently. Uh, I think it was something uh, like 3,000 grams per hectoliter of esters, the ester count. Of course, we don't count all of them. Uh, let me count a few. Uh, There we go. Uh, so if you see here, well, I, wait, let me fix my settings. I know this is a very unorthodox way of showing it, but let me just I might do this. I guess I will stop share first. Okay, um, so if you'll see here, we test for a bunch of congeners. I know it's like the other way. I wish I could show it on the screen. Um, so we test for acetaldehyde, isopropanol, propanol, diacetyl, ethyl acetate, isobutanol, 1-butanol, 2-pentanol. So the the high ester rum is very high in ethyl acetate, uh, 2 pentanol, 
and propanol. Um, it's ester, or at least the volatile substances or the ester count in grams per hectoliter. Um, it's about 9,713.4. Okay, so, so you have everything counted. That's great to know that you know what you're doing in that matter. <laughs> yes, and on the small batch, we when we tested it last, so this was sometime this sometime November, the small batch was at 270.5 grams per hectoliter. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll have that shown on the screen next. I was actually debating putting that up, but I, it was never asked in a master class. I'm really happy it was asked now. Um, I always have that data on hand, and this was the right audience. So, yeah. So that's on the small batch. And I guess while if you guys have questions, I'll just also talk about this might answer a few people's questions on the Pedro Jimenez. Um, it was aged solely in a Pedro Jimenez cask, uh, put in at 65% ABV. So that gives you an indication of sort of uh, we, we lose we lose alcohol at Luisita, but not by a big amount. Um, so personally, I got some candied fruit, dried raisins, uh, fig jam or fig newtons. They kind of reminded me of that snack. Uh, smoked cacao, some coffee, and I get also a bit of like these balsamic notes um, in it. Uh, the other one being barrel 2183, which precious liquors had uh, unselected. Um, when they came over, so you get that toasted vanilla, some of that caramelized brown sugar, sort of you would imagine like a creme brulee, the top layer. Uh, that's what we go for, and that that kind of shines through also on the distillate. Um, bananas. Uh, there's some winey notes to it, uh, and then I, we call it nutty cacao, but we're still trying to find the right term for it. Uh, because there's a local chocolate here in the Philippines, you know, being a mass market, even our chocolates are mass market style chocolates where it's not actually cacao. They use sort of uh, peanuts with flavored chocolate to, to, to make our chocolate. I know it sounds weird, but pretty yummy. <laughs> um, so that's barrel 2183. Uh, entry proof was at 60%. So we play around in Luisita. We have, I have some barrels at 55%. And then we've gone as high as 70%. 70% is a bad idea. 55%, we have something there. Hello. I yeah. have a question about, uh, you mentioned before that you use three types of uh, different molasses, if I understand you right. Can you tell yeah. a little bit more about that? What is the main difference between them? Mm, okay. Um, so we use three kinds. So the first one being sorry, the first strike molasses. Uh, I think the industry calls it grade A, grade A molasses. Uh, so this is the mola, the first press uh, or after the boiling house when they kind of cook the sugarcane juice. This is sort of the first slurry that we get of molasses uh, where there has been no extraction of sugar crystals. So the bricks is still very high, the sugar content is still very high. So that's the first um, element of our molasses blend. Um, and then we have black strap molasses in it as well, or C grade molasses, uh, which would be almost not, not half of the blend, but a, a big part, about 35 to 40%. So we have to do this also because um, for economical reasons, uh, we just produce a lot of black strap, and if we got all the A molasses, the sugar would be, the sugar wouldn't be there, and I wouldn't have money to buy barrels anymore. Uh, joke, joke, joking aside, um, the third one would be what we call, and I have yet to really find the proper term for it, or someone who's familiar with it, at least in the rum industry. It's very well known in the sugar industry, but in the rum industry, it's not talked about, or I don't know if 
if they know what it is and they've been using it, it's refinery molasses. So this is the molasses um, as a byproduct of the um, refinery or the process that makes white sugar or refined sugar. So in our refinery, a lot of people, um, a lot of people have this bad stigma on white sugar and they think that you bleach it and yada, yada, yada. Uh, in the Philippines, um, I know for a fact, and especially at, at our mill, uh, the only, there's no bleaching happening, there's no extenders being put. So, so what happens, and this is what allows us to have the molasses, is the raw sugar or the brown sugar is just spun around a carbon column in the middle. And this just grabs everything else. And that's how we make white sugar. So that everything else now turns into the refinery molasses, which is very sweet. It's almost as sweet as maple syrup. Uh, and that's what that's what I use on my pancake. So that's the that's what the, the blend is made up of. So refinery molasses is way higher in bricks and quality than even grade A molasses from the mill. Thank you. Hmm, thank you. And uh, for how long uh, are you finishing uh, this uh, addition for for ex bourbon and for for ex sherry uh, pakes? Uh, so it's six years uh, uh, before finishing, and the finish process is uh, half a year or or how long? Um, come again. So what do you mean on the finishing? How long do we? Because uh, uh, after after six years, uh, you you're recasting uh, your rum, yes. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. So after and for how long? After... For Pedro Jimenez, for example, how long it uh, it take extra aging time for the, for the Pedro Jimenez uh, edition? So for the Pedro Jimenez, um, actually. Uh, it's not recast. So we put fresh distillate into a freshly oh. dumped Pedro Jimenez barrel. So this has never touched an ex bourbon cask. Oh, okay. So all, all the time in, in ex Pedro Jimenez. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, everyone was, I think I was looking at brands like Dos Madeiras and of course Makala and you see Sherry finished and all that. And even the guy sharing, selling me the Sherry cask said, you just use this to finish your rum. But you know, as farmers, we, we have a few loose screws up here. So I, I didn't listen to him and I decided, you know, we're just going to age straight there and see what happens. It was not good for the first three years. Uh, even on the fourth year, I was beginning to question like, okay, I made quite an expensive mistake, but it really opened up on year five. And now year six, we have a few more that will age further, maybe to seven, eight years. And we're excited to see what comes out. Uh, I've got a question about the PX cast. Where do the smoky aromas come from? Is that from charring of the barrel? So yeah, really interesting. No, um, I, I was having a conversation with my dad, and when we did when we we did the GC analysis, because we would pick up some of that smokiness, and I think you're picking it up as well. Uh, the barrel is not actually charred; it's just toasted. Um, so. It could have. It could be. It's definitely one of those things that uh, we'll study more. But I guess it's. It, there's a lot of chemistry going on. It could be some of the acids that are made during fermentation, and then mixed with some of the tannins and formed that smoky flavor. But uh, I I checked the barrel just to be a hundred percent sure that there was no char, and it's there is no char in there. Um, it's just toasted. So, so it it was also sur surprised to me. This this barrel is actually our surprise barrel, surprise baby, so to speak. Because we had no idea this was gonna come out like the way it did, and you don't really see many people aging solely also in a sherry cask. So this just 
this was really uh, an exciting one. Well, bravo, because that one's excellent. I love it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we have first feedback at least. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to want to tell us what 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 he feels in their rams in their in their glasses? Anyone else? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I have uh, one more question to you, Paco. Uh, yes. What I I guess you have. Uh, what uh, do you have um, development plans for your rams? Do you have some plans for new cask or new or I don't know new 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 creation um, forms? You know uh, uh, what can we expect? in later okay uh i guess i'll give you guys sort of short medium long term um so short term you can expect a few more single barrels we have about five more five well six one is kind of like it's called a 4.5 and technically it should be a five so we might revisit it again so we have about five or six x bourbon single barrels that we will probably be releasing um short term i think maybe in the next year or so or at least year and a, a year to a year and a half uh we also will be doing a blend of our sherry again i may be unheard of but i'll kind of do the oloroso and px and just bang see what happens if you blend them together uh hopefully it comes out good um the intention there is getting the oloroso was a, a little more uh i guess you would say drier um in a sense uh, then the other one is fruitier so you, well, hopefully we get something good there uh then as i mentioned a while ago we we have a pot still that's waiting for us on a boat somewhere in customs uh, it's, traffic is a big problem here in the philippines also at our ports so once that pot still comes in, um, this is more medium term plans. Uh, we'll be taking, I guess, a page out of uh, what Foursquare does, where it'll be our column still listed it, and then some of the pots still aged drum. Um, we'll also be playing, and then long term, I guess, we'll be playing with a lot of. Uh, um, open fermentation and the like. At least that's for distillation. Products wise, uh, later in the year, maybe if not already part of next year, we'll be having a we call, locally we 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 call it the reserva. So this is a forty percent product. Uh, it's blended, sort of the same price point as Don Papa. Um, the youngest rum in it is four years old, um, and it's just a blend between uh the different ages and the different ages and marks that we have inside x bourbon barrels uh then the small batch will be released in big form so that's uh and sort of our that'll be our take on vintage so you'll you'll notice there we indicate crop year so so as a farmer um the crop year that's because it takes at least a year for the sugar cane to grow, we want to play up that point. So expect um, blends as sort of keeping SKUs, but a lot more um, fun and flavor coming out of the small batch or what we like to call the crop year or vintage releases. Because that's what the that's really what the dream is is to be able to showcase how the flavor really and it does it really changes year on and year out. Um, we know it's very well known in wine, but maybe not so much in sugarcane, especially molasses based um, uh, rum, maybe agricole, probably it's not a foreign concept, but even the taste of the molasses changes. So, you know, I can say with full confidence that 
Um, this carries through even for molasses-based ramen. So we want to highlight this. Uh, so the products will look like that. Um, and there's going to be a white rum also. Uh, we'll be doing a lightly aged white rum. Uh, hopefully once that pot still is up and running so I can put a little more funk. Uh, I do like a good Veritas or Claron daiquiri. Okay, what about single pot still? Did you, did you, did you thought about it? Come again? Uh, what about a single pot oh, still? Yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, but that, that's very long term plan. So if we make, you know, I'm, I'm keeping my expectations low. Uh, I'm very new to the distillation game. Um, I know more about farming, as I said. Um, and this distillation is still, I'm still learning, still like a madman messaging the likes of Maggie Campbell and, and, and the Foursquare guy, seeing if they'll throw me some advice. Uh, but definitely in the pot still, if we can produce something of quality this year, we'll put it into a barrel and see how it tastes two years, three years, four years from now. Uh, so then that'll be maybe a five-year thing before you actually start seeing some 100% pots still Louis Eater rum. Okay, nice, nice. nice. Ako, I have another question about uh, angels. Yeah. Share. Compared to the Caribbean, uh, what, what percentage of angel share do you have per year? So our angel share on year one is at about 7 to 8%. Uh, and then on year two, it jumps actually to about 10 to 12, because I think it, it lost some of the, the headroom. Um, of course, this is all under conditions where there's no owner's share or farmer's share being taken out. Uh -huh. But it's relatively, I think we're a little lower as compared to, let's say, the Caribbean, because if if... If you look at Tarlac on the map, so maybe if, if you have, if you, if you want to Google it later, where Luisita is, we're landlocked. Um, so hum, although we are in the tropics, uh, it's not humid throughout the year. So it's humid maybe six to eight months out of the year, where relative humidity is at like ninety nine percent. Uh, but we have a pronounced wet and dry season. So they now we're just kind of exiting the dry season where temperatures were pretty cool considering the philippines so we were all in sweaters at 18 degrees celsius you have to uh, give us that that's as cold as it gets in our region so any excuse to put on a sweater will do that uh but relative humidity this past few months was, you know it plays somewhere between 45 to about 60 percent so it's it's tropical, but at the same time, it experiences maybe half of the year this cool, dry period where um, I would imagine, based on what I've read, uh, the interaction is a little slower. Um, and uh, I've been told actually by by Maggie of Mount Gay, Maggie Campbell actually advised that maybe that would be the best time to harvest the rum as opposed to when it was really when it's really hot and humid because the interaction is so strong um we might just disturb it so we, we as you can see we treat it as it's, it's like this living thing and um we treat it with so much care so all of these factors come into play and we're just at this stage where we're taking data and trying to still understand um, what our unique climate being that there's no body of water near us, really. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so, uh, guys, any any more questions? Uh, Steven, UK. Um, this is really has uh, been excellent. You are. Really very passionate and ah, disappeared. Um, message Thank from Thank you Stephen. very much for the kind words. Uh, a message to Stephen, yes, uh, the rounds will be available in the UK. Stay, stay tuned and co contact us if you uh, want to know more details. But yes, it's coming to the UK as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what's your favorite rum tonight? 
Okay, I'll start uh, maybe to huh? encourage uh, the rest. Um, I should say that my favorite one was the Cask 2183, right, Paco? I should say that. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but I really love the uh, PX uh, as well. Uh, the small batch I would recommend to every entry uh level of rum drinker that loves whiskey because to be fair at least uh in my glass it was really really close to to really uh, good uh uh whiskey because of the aromas the sweetness and the balance uh over there uh so it was it, all of them were great but of course, uh, the top one for me is uh, my uh, single uh, bourbon cask, but the PX. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was great. Uh, it, 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 and the smoky notes I also um, found in here. So it was really, really, really good. And you can't uh, actually it's what 64 right now, more or less, right? Um, alcohol and it's really smooth when it comes to that it's more spicy than you can get the alcohol it's not overwhelming it's really really great yeah i agree i agree thanks for that. uh okay anyone else want to want to uh, share about well yes for for me also uh two single casts are really head to head uh with slightly higher notes for bourbon single cask. I'm mainly a whiskey drinker. So uh, I wouldn't agree with uh, with you that a small batch is better for me, but uh, the bourbon single cask is really, really, really nice. Okay. But the rest is also yeah. very good. Yeah, all four are really interesting yeah. and Very nice. uh, yes, we we tried Don Papa a few times. Uh, we like it, of course, and mm. yeah, but it's mainly very sweet. And in in your rums, uh, there's a lot more to look for than just sweetness. So it's it's more refined. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Hania and Bartek. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, okay. Anyone else want to share about this rounds? Its feelings? So, uh, guys and, and girls, <laughs> thank you very much for this evening. Uh, I hope you like it. Uh, my favorite from uh, this evening is uh, PX. Uh, on the second place is Single Barrel, uh, and yeah, I really, really like it. Um, to be honest, uh, this uh, I had these bottles up two weeks about, I think. And uh, this evening, uh, uh, I tried them first time, you know. Uh, so I really, really was um, um, uh, um, surprised about about this room. So yeah, I like it very much. Pavel, uh, Pavel from Precious Liquors asked me asked me uh, many times, "Did you try them already? What do you think?" And such like things. Uh, yeah, I didn't have. Uh, so much time, so yeah, I did it. I did it this evening, and I'm really, really impressed in this round. Yeah, this is this is, this is my my feelings about it. So so yeah, if you have uh, any questions uh, after the, this meeting, you can write email to me or this guy from 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 the card. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. I'm gonna just repeat, just uh, to, so you remember, uh, to receive the pricing list and offer for purchase and distribution or any other question regarding the 
sales of uh, those great Louis Citerams, uh, contact uh, Piotr, Peter from the business card and contact Chris if you have any other questions. <laughs> And uh, on behalf of Precious Liquors, once again, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I know it's late and I know it's early, Paco. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for you to stay uh, this late with us. But I hope you enjoyed this time. I hope you enjoyed the liquids and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thanks, guys. And um... Yeah, and any questions, uh, we also are on social media. Um, I'm a, main, mainly on Instagram, so Luis Itaram. Uh, you'll find me there also, Paco Coanco. You just type in Paco, I'm there. Uh, if you have any questions, just shoot them my way, and then you'll see. I, I enjoy posting like behind-the-scenes stuff of what we do on the farm, at the distillery. So if you're into that kind of thing, uh, that's really all I post apart from a few memes uh so yeah uh it was really great meeting you guys hearing the feedback uh we're really excited to be bringing sort of a different kind of rum uh to the world and showcasing another side of what the philippines can do so thank you so much guys yeah thank you very much thank you and thank you see you guys each other in the future thanks thanks very much bye bye, bye, -bye. Thanks, guys. Sleep. I All hope right. everyone has a good I can send you uh, this uh, this this video uh, by email or or whatever if you want to 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 uh, um, other 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 um, uh, possibility. Yeah. So so yeah. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye guys. Bye bye. Keep safe.